<clears throat> and as Nancy announced, the topic is uh, relationship between the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. The last uh, week, uh, Tuesday and Thursday, we focused on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. On Tuesday, we spoke about how, uh, uh, unlike what many people think, the gifts are operational even today. The topic was gifts of the Holy Spirit. Are they relevant today or are they obsolete? Already over in the first century. We found the answer from the scriptures is as much relevant today as ever before. On Thursday, we spoke about how we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Is it by earning it or by believing what we heard? And again, we looked at Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, where it talks about how we don't earn these gifts, but we receive it by faith. Now, there are people, in spite of all these things mentioned in the Bible, that this, these gifts are for today, and we receive it by faith, and it's a gift. A gift is not earned, it's received. Still, there are people, many churches, who do not believe that the gifts are operational even today, and they believe that it's all over in the first century. And then they go on to compare the gifts with the fruit. Because Jesus said in uh, Matthew 7, chapter, verse 15 and verse 20 also, you'll know them by the fruit. And the identity of a Christian is known by the fruit that the Christian bears. And fruit can mean so many things, but in the context of the Spirit, is the fruit of the Spirit. And they will say, many people today, gifts are not important. It's all over in the first century. You must bear the fruit of the Spirit. Praise God for that. God wants to bear the fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Not the fruit of the Christian. It's a fruit of the Spirit, which is seen in a Christian, when the Christian lives by the Spirit. And we're going to see the connection between the gifts and the fruit. One more reason for us to believe that these gifts are operational even today. Without the gifts, in fact, it's called charismata or manifestations. When the Holy Spirit is upon us. He manifests in different ways. And 1 Corinthians 12, chapter 8 to 10 identifies nine different manifestations or nine different gifts of the Holy Spirit. Nine charismata. Charismata means gifts of grace. They are actually manifestations. When the anointing is upon us, he manifests in different ways. Nine different manifestations. Which also means that when you have anointed by the Spirit, any one of these manifestations can be seen in our lives. The fruit is actually one fruit. It's not fruits. In Galatians chapter 5, 20 to 23 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Lord said, you know them by the fruit. You identify the false teachers, false prophets by their fruit, what is evident in their lives. In the same way, you identify the genuine people of God by their fruit. The fruit comes from the seed. An orange seed can't bear apple fruit. An apple seed cannot bear orange fruit. If you're born of the Spirit of God, you naturally bear the fruit of the Spirit. You're born of God, Spirit of God. And naturally, the fruit will be of the Spirit only. It can't be anything else. That's how I identify. How you identify God's people, genuine people of God, is by the fruit. One fruit with nine qualities, which means all these nine qualities God wants to bear in the life of a Christian to make us a display of his splendor. In the Old Testament time, God told about his people through Isaiah. Isaiah 49.3 you are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. He told the nation of Israel to be given the commandments, and as they would obey the commandments, God's 
identity will be known to all the nations of the world. They were meant to be priests, a priestly nation for the rest of the nations. And he told them, you are my servant Israel, in you I will display my splendor. And they failed God, Old Testament time. And later on, God spoke in prophecy about New Testament believers. Isaiah chapter 61, the first three verses are called the Messianic prophecy. It's a prophecy about the anointing on the Messiah. Isaiah 61, 3, it's written about the beneficiaries of this amazing New Testament grace. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Wherever we are in this world today as Christians, we are a planting of the Lord to display his splendor. It's confirmed in the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are the workmanship of God. He works in and through us to display the fruit of the Spirit. All nine qualities of the fruit. And therefore, when we live a life in the Spirit, led by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, we live a life by the wisdom given by the Holy Spirit, and the power given by the Holy Spirit in time will bear the fruit. Even in normal terms, a fruit takes time to bear. You plant a seed, it becomes a plant, it grows, becomes a tree. And then over a period of time, depending on what seed it is, it will bear fruit. There's a time interval between seed planting and fruit bearing. In the same way, as Christians, when you live a life led by the Spirit, all nine qualities of the fruit will be seen in our lives. Now, for that to happen, we should live by the Spirit and also seek from Jesus to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. He anoints us with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit comes upon us, there are manifestations of that anointing. Nine manifestations or nine gifts. We're going to see tonight, out of the nine gifts, what are those gifts required for us to be able to bear this one fruit with nine qualities. Now, out of the nine gifts, you list all the nine gifts mentioned in 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians 8 to 10. I'll just quote all the nine gifts. I mentioned them. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, gift of faith, gifts of healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits or discerning of spirits, tongues and interpretation of tongues. Nine qualities. Now, for a moment, let's forget about fruit. Just imagine if God were to ask you tonight, uh, what do you want me to give you? By the way, we are supposed to desire gifts. In 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Nothing wrong desiring gifts. And the purpose of desiring is to use these gifts to fulfill God's purpose. God has a purpose for all of us to bear the fruit. The fruit with nine qualities. Now, if God would ask us tonight, what are the gifts you want? Imagine you want to bear the fruit. Which gifts would you ask God? Which gifts would you ask God? Of course, we like to have all the nine gifts. But there are some specific gifts which are basically, I would use the term, underrated, not in demand on the part of Christians. These three gifts are vital to bear the fruit. In the list of the desire of most Christians, these gifts won't be in the top priority. Normally, when you ask, uh, God would ask us, what do you want me to give you in the terms of gifts? People say, I want uh, miraculous powers. I want gifts of healing. I want prophecy. I want tongues. They are glamorous gifts. But the three gifts I'm going to identify today for us to bear the fruit are not very glamorous. 
they are most un, 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 not in demand gifts. They're not uh, the underrated gifts. What are those gifts? I'm going to see. I'm going to share with you. Now, these nine qualities of the fruit, I'm going to divide into three categories. Three categories. Peace and joy, first category. Love, goodness, kindness, gentleness, second category. Third category is faith, patience, and self-control. If you have pen and paper, write down on the top, peace and joy, put a bracket, put a bracket. Then below that, uh, write love, goodness, kindness, gentleness, put a bracket or a circle. And third category, faith, patience, and self-control. Again, one bracket. For each of these brackets, one particular gift is enough to bear that aspect of the fruit. Let's take peace and joy. Peace and joy is conditional to obedience. We receive peace and joy at the point of time we accept Christ as Savior and Lord. Peace means oneness with God. We are one with God through Christ. And uh, by faith in Christ, we are one with Him. And the word peace basically means oneness. The Greek word is irene, E I R E N E. And in Colossians chapter 1, 1920, Paul writes, Colossians 1, 1920, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, meaning in Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, the things in heaven or things on earth, by making peace through blood shed on the cross. So we've been given peace by believing in Christ. We already have peace. He is our peace. Micah chapter 5, verse 5. Similarly, at that point of time, when you accept Christ as Savior and Lord, His Spirit comes and dwells in us as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. So we have the hope of glory. Christ in us is hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 And we rejoice Rejoicing is a verb. Corresponding noun is joy. We rejoice because we have joy. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So by accepting Christ as Savior and Lord, we reconcile to God, we've been given peace and joy. The same peace He has, He has given to us. John 14, 27, He told the apostles, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. I don't give as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. My peace I give unto you. Meaning, the same peace he had, oneness with the Father, is given to us. Through him, we have oneness with God. The same joy he had, he has given to us. In John 15, 11, he told the apostles, I've told you this, that my joy will be in you, your joy will be complete. My joy will be in you. The same joy he had, he has given to us. Through the work of Christ on the cross, you and me have entered into the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, called Romans 14, 17, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Today, as Christians, <clears throat> we don't search for peace. We've been given peace. We don't search for joy. We've been given joy. And our responsibility, our mandate, is to preserve the peace and joy of the Lord. To preserve this peace and joy, we walk in obedience to His teachings. The Lord is a selfless God. Because nature is, he's selfless. When he wants us to obey him, it's not for his good, it's for our good. We are beneficiaries of obedience to the teachings of Jesus. 
he wants us to have the peace and joy, to preserve the peace and joy. So he says, you obey me. He's a selfless God. We don't do God a favor by obeying him. We do ourselves a favor by obeying him. We preserve the peace and joy. That is why you find the last one week of his physical life on this earth, the Lord taught the apostles, the 11 apostles, one had gone to betray him, 13th chapter of John, and the remaining 11 were there. He's teaching them because after he goes back to heaven, the apostle will be teaching God's word. When the church is formed, they devote themselves to apostles' teachings. The Lord taught them. He spoke about peace. He spoke about joy. Because he knew very soon after his crucifixion, the kingdom of God will come upon people who believe in him. So he told about peace and joy to the apostles. John 16, 33. He told them, after teaching, the instructions he gave, I have told you these things, that in me you will have peace. In the world you will have troubles. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I have told you these things. In other words, you listen to what I am telling you. Observe my teachings. Live by my teachings. The world will have troubles. In me you have peace. Similarly, in John 15 chapter, 9, 10, 11, he tells them, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you remain my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. If you obey my commandments, to remain in his love and experience his joy, we must listen to his teachings. So after turning to Christ, after being given the peace and joy of the Lord, we preserve the peace and joy by walking in obedience to his teachings. So peace and joy preservation is conditional to obeying the teachings of Jesus. To be able to obey the teachings of Jesus, he gives us the gift of faith. One of the nine gifts of the Spirit is the gift of faith. When you obey God by the faith the Holy Spirit gives us, it's a joyful obedience. In 1 John chapter 5, 3, 4 and 5, we read, this is love for God to obey His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory overcomes the world? Even our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? He believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So we need to ask God for the gift of faith given by the Holy Spirit for us to be able to obey Him consistently walk with him consistently and thereby manifest peace and joy consistently. The Bible read about a man by the name Enoch who walked with God. 300 years he walked with God. 300 years he walked with God. At the age of 65 he had a son. Thereafter for 300 years he walked with God. What's the secret of his walk with God? What is the, the key to his walking with God? We find the answer in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews 11, 5 and 6, we read, By faith, Enoch was taken from his life. He couldn't be found because God took him away. He didn't experience death. He didn't taste death. He couldn't be found because God took him away. And before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we ask God for more and more faith, which is given to us also by the anointing of the Spirit. One of the manifestations of the anointing is the gift of faith. With that faith, we please God all the time. As we please God, we'll walk with God. When you walk with God, we manifest peace and joy. So we need faith. Faith to be able to obey him joyfully. 
The obedience that comes from faith is a joyful obedience, not a burdensome obedience. In fact, Romans 1.5 says, obedience comes from faith. You know why people find it difficult to obey God? They don't depend upon the Holy Spirit for faith. And that's one thing the disciples understood. When the Lord told them, the 17th chapter of Luke 3 and 4, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times a day, and seven times he repents, forgive him. And they say in response, they ask him, increase our faith. Meaning, I want more faith to be able to forgive someone seven times a day. When they were told by the same Lord, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons and cleanse of leprosy, didn't ask for more faith. They had faith. They believed when they prayed, God will heal the sick, raise the dead also, cast out demons and cleanse of leprosy. That's a work of God. Christians only pray. God only heals. Like doctors treat, God heals. Always the healer is Jesus. Now, that's for healing. So when they were told to heal the sick, raise the dead, Matthew 10, 8, they went without asking for more faith. They had confidence. I, I'll go. God will do it. Whereas to forgive someone seven times a day, it's our decision. We should want to forgive, decide to forgive. And for that, we need faith. Obedience comes from faith. This obedience is a joyful obedience. It's not at all a burden. So every one of us needs the gift of faith identified among the gifts of the Holy Spirit for us to be able to obey. We all have a measure of faith according to various other factors. Like as we hear the word of God, faith increases. As we pray for faith, faith increases. As we face trials joyfully, faith increases. As we remember God's faithfulness in the past, we can have the faith to face the crisis today, faith increases. After all that, when you face a crisis of test and temptation, and you feel you don't have faith, please ask for the gift of faith to be able to say no to temptation. First Corinthians 10.13 says, God is faithful. You will already be tested more than you can bear. With every temptation or test, there's a way out. You can stand up under it. The word used there for temptation is a word called pyrasmos. Very often I share this on the Zoom. Pyrasmos can also mean test. Temptation and test, the same word in Greek is used. So when you have a test or temptation, there's a way out. God is faithful. You know how much we can take. According to the test we have got, he'll give us the resources to face it. What the resource gives us? Strength and faith. So please keep on asking God for the gift of faith to be able to face temptations, obey God, and thereby preserve the peace and the joy of the Lord. So peace and joy, first category, what is the gift you should ask God? Gift of faith. Second category is love, goodness, kindness, and gentleness. Love, agape love, sacrificial love, goodness, kindness, they are all related to love. They are, I would call them uh, uh, siblings of love or, or twins of <laughs> love, quadruplets. Love, goodness, kindness, gentleness. Gentleness is also referred to as meekness which is basically humility. When you have love, you are humble. First Corinthians 13 chapter, verse 4 onwards. Love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, it is not proud. So meekness and gentleness comes as a result of love. The main gift is love. And every one of us is called to manifest this love. For 13th chapter of First Corinthians, 13th verse says, three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. Greatest is love. And this love is one of the aspects of the 
fruit of the spirit. Now, how does love come to our hearts? As we grow in the knowledge of God, we will have his love in us. God is love. 1 John 4, 16. God is love. He is a personification of love. And every one of us is called to grow in the knowledge of God. In 2 Peter 3, 18, Paul writes, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's no limit to love. And as we grow in the, in the love of God, first grow in the love of God, we need to know him more and more. The Lord just said when he spoke to the Father in heaven, he prayed, 17th chapter of John, verse 26, he told the Father, and he prayed for the disciples. I have made you known to them and I will continue making you known to them that the love you have for me will be in them and I myself will be in them. So many times I shared this verse. It, it never uh, fails to amaze me, this verse. Always I love to read this verse. That shows when you <clears throat> grow in the knowledge of God, you have the love of God in you. And the Lord said that in the last one week of his physical life on this earth. I made you known to them. I will continue making you known to them. How is it going to happen? He's going to be crucified in a few days. Go back to God the Father. How will he keep on revealing himself? To the Holy Spirit. Now as we grow in the knowledge of God, what happens? His love we put into our hearts. He says to the Father, the love you have for me will be in them. That love is perfect love. The love God the Father which he has for God the Son is perfect love. Nothing lacking in that. That love will be manifest into our hearts by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's the fruit of the Spirit. Even as we grow in the knowledge of God. Now, coming back to the gifts. To grow in the knowledge of God, there's one particular gift we should ask. That is the gift of discerning of spirits. 1 Corinthians 12 chapter verse 10. Discerning of spirits. To know God more and more, we should discern Holy Spirit speaking to us as compared to devil speaking to us, as compared to our own spirit speaking to us, as compared to our own minds telling us many things. A Christian can be influenced by the Holy Spirit. Like it says about Stephen, Acts 8, chapter verse 10, people could not stand up against the wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. We can sometimes speak by the evil spirit also. When Peter told Jesus in Matthew 16, 22, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you, the Lord rebuked him. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So Peter said that to Jesus, influenced by the evil spirit. It can happen to us also. If you don't be careful and discern, you can listen to wrong voice. A third voice that speaks to us is our own spirits. Ezekiel chapter 13, 2 and 3 talks about the prophets who spoke by their own spirits. And finally, Jeremiah 23 chapter, verse 16 talks about the prophets who spoke the delusion of their own minds. They had a dream. I had a dream, they say. They had a dream and that means from God. Delusions of our own minds can speak to us. When you have this gift of discerning of spirits, you can know when God speaks. You can recognize a vitally important gift for us to filter what's not from God. To grow this knowledge, we should know when he speaks. He reveals himself to us through his word and through his spirit. When you have this gift, it's very important today because today in the modern world, a postmodern world, there are so many meetings we can have access to on Zoom. All over the world, any speaker, anywhere, they have access. 
There's a click of the button, you can go and join. And unless you have the gift of discerning, you will not know whether this person is speaking rightly or wrong. And you hear a reputation of the man, oh, he got a very big church, growing church, and you begin to think, oh, because it's growing, he must speak the right things. Not necessarily. It can be wrong teaching, attractive teaching, but wrong teaching. People can have a very good gift of teaching, but wrong content. That's more dangerous than, you know, people don't have their gift. Because when you have the gift of teaching, being able to communicate, you have wrong content, you communicate something wrong in a wonderful way. Communication is excellent. Content is inaccurate. Very dangerous. We get carried away by the method of teaching, by the, uh, the charisma of that person. Check the content. Always check the content. You have discernment. You can look at the content and realize is it from God or not. When Paul went to Berea, 70 chapter of Acts, verse 11, Bible says the Bereans were of noble character. For this is what I've got great eagerness and examine the scriptures daily. See what Paul is saying is true or not. They discern. Is it from God's scriptures? Is it having confirmation in my heart is from God? So wait upon God. Don't simply jump at every, every uh, thing that you hear. Like I said, so many preachers all over the world today we can have access to. You hear about reputations about the whole oh, wonderful church, growing church, this is happening, that's happening, miracles are happening. You get carried away. Please always check the content of the teaching in the light of God's word and please ask for discernment. Then you can know what's from God, what's not from God. If it's from God, you receive it. In that process, you grow in the knowledge of God. When we grow in the knowledge of God, we will grow in love. That's so what Jesus said. I made you known to them. <clears throat> I'll cut you making known to them that the love you for me will be in them. Now, it's very important to understand to have closeness to God, we must have the love of God. And as you come close to God, you'll have the love of God. With bitterness, you can't even begin to have fellowship with God. <clears throat> the flip side of love is when you have bitterness, and we have bitterness, you can't even enjoy God. In Mark 11, 24, 25, Jesus said, Mark 11, chapter 24, 25, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you receive it. And it be yours. And when you stand praying, remember you hold against someone, forgive him. Which means, with bitterness, you can't even begin to have fellowship one-to-one -one with God. When you have close fellowship with God, you know him more and more, you love his love. In fact, instead of love, when you have bitterness, you can't even go to God in prayer and uh, have confidence He's hearing you. It's first, go make peace. Forgive, then come to me. <clears throat> and therefore, discernment is a very important gift, very underrated gift. Very few people ask for this gift today. They ask for miraculous powers, prophecy, tongues, maybe even word of wisdom, word of knowledge but not discernment. And God knows we need discernment. He will give it to us, surely. He knows we need it. So, <clears throat> faith for peace and joy. Discernment for knowing God more and more. In that process, manifesting love, kindness, goodness, gentleness. Third category is basically three qualities of the fruit. <coughs> Faith, self-control, and patience. Patience, faith, and self-control. These three qualities are worked out by God in the life of a Christian using his tools. What are his tools? Difficult people, difficult circumstances. When difficult people come in our lives, it's the answer to our prayer for self-control, for patience, for faith. Similarly, difficult circumstances. So, to face difficult circumstances, God gives us one more gift of the Holy Spirit. What is that? Wisdom. Wisdom. When you have the wisdom of God, 
given by the Holy Spirit. By the way, there are two kinds of wisdom. Man's wisdom, God's wisdom. Man's wisdom, according to James chapter 3, 13 to 16, is earthly, unspiritual of the devil. It's demonic. Whereas God's wisdom, according to James 3, 17, first of all, pure, peaceable, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. This wisdom is hidden in Christ. In fact, this wisdom is secret, it's hidden. First Corinthians 2, 7 says it's hidden, it's secret. Where is it hidden? Colossians 2, 3 says about Christ, in him are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. As we live for Jesus and cry out to him for the anointing, he pours the anointing upon us. One of the aspects of anointing is the word of wisdom, the rhema of wisdom, the instruction of wisdom, how to respond to difficult people who provoke us, who insult us, who offend us. Proverbs 19.11. Proverbs 19.11. A man's wisdom gives him patience. It's to his glory to overlook an offense. When people offend you, they criticize you, you don't react, you overlook it. Now Moses was a man full of wisdom, I believe. In fact, when he laid hands upon Joshua, book of Deuteronomy, 34 chapter verse 9 says, Joshua received the spirit of wisdom when Moses laid his hands upon him. Moses put his hands upon Joshua, and Joshua received the spirit of wisdom. Take Moses' example. His own brother and sister rose up against him. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of his Cushite wife. 13th chapter of Numbers. They told him, has God spoken to you only? Has not spoken to us also? Moses didn't retaliate. He didn't respond. And God took up his case. He called all three together and tells Miriam and Aaron, and the prophet is among you, I speak to visions and dreams, not so with my servant Moses. With him I speak face to face. God took up his case. Later on, you find his cousin, Korah, spoke against him. And Moses lay prostrate. Moses lay prostrate. 16 chapter of Numbers, verse 4. And God vindicated him. He didn't retaliate. A wise man won't respond to insults and provocations. He will not react. He will respond in a godly way. So ask God wisdom to respond to people who provoke you, who offend you. A man's wisdom gives them patience. It says, glory to overlook an offense. Now, we need patience in difficult circumstances, not only people, circumstances. Wait for God to change circumstances. There again, we need patience. And patience comes from wisdom, I told you, for all aspects of life. Also, when people provoke us, without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we can react through our pride. In the book of Ecclesiastes, 7th chapter, 8 and 9, we read, the end of the matter is better than the beginning and patience better than pride. Don't be quickly provoked in your spirit for anger besides in the lap of fools. Short-temperedness is basically because of pride. Our ego gets provoked. Short temperedness. Short fuse. Just blows just like that. One small provocation, it blows. The Bible says, <clears throat> patience is better than pride. Patience comes from wisdom. Humility comes from wisdom. Very interesting, you'll find patience and humility go together. Impatience and pride go together. A proud man is very impatient. He reacts to people who criticize him. Anger by is not wrong. Man's anger doesn't bring up a righteous life God desires. I will qualify in James 1.20 about man's anger. Man's anger does not bring up a righteous life God desires. God's anger is different from man's anger. God is slow to anger. We are quick to anger. 
When God gets angry, he doesn't sin. When we get angry, we invariably sin. Solution for pride is, again, wisdom. James 3.13. Who is wise in understanding among you? Let him show by his good life. By these, then the humility that comes from wisdom. Humility comes from wisdom. How simple it is. And God loves to give wisdom to all his people. If our problem is pride and impatience, solution is wisdom. And God gives wisdom to everyone who lacks. James 1.5 If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Who gives generously to all without finding fault? It will be given. Which means none of us should be impatient. None of us should be proud. Because he gives all wisdom. And wisdom will teach us humility and patience. Okay, how beautiful it is to understand that. No? Every day we need God's wisdom. Every morning when we start the day, say, Lord, give me wisdom for this day, Lord. And how does it come? Through application of scripture, obedience of scripture, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The word of wisdom. 1 Corinthians 12, chapter verse 8. A rhema of wisdom. When you face a difficult person, face a difficult circumstance, at that point of time, he'll give you wisdom to know how to respond, how to react. So three very vitally important gifts to bear all nine aspects of the fruit. Three gifts only. Faith, by which you obey God consistently. Obey God consistently, preserve the peace and joy of God. Discernment, by which you can grow in the knowledge of God. As you know him more and more, who is a personification of love, you will have his love. How do you know if God is love or not? When perfect love comes into our hearts, fear goes away. There's no fear. 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. So, with discernment, we know God more and more. We'll have his love. Love, goodness, kindness, gentleness. Third gift, wisdom. When you have wisdom, you can face difficult people, difficult circumstances, and you'll have faith, patience, and self-control not to react to people. Now just think, if God would ask you a nine gift, what would you say? Would you have asked for these three? I'm sure ask for, uh, you know, uh, miraculous powers, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, healing, nothing wrong. All nine you can ask. But if you want to bear the fruit, then these nine, are, these three are very important. With just three gifts, three manifestations, all nine aspects of fruit can be seen in our lives. So ask yourself, have you asked God for fruit of spirit, all nine qualities? Then ask him for the three gifts. Desire these gifts, he'll give it to you. He knows we can't do without his strength. Now also I'm sure you understand by now that the gifts are as, as important today as was in the first century. We have got a bad fruit today like we, they did in those days. So how can we say those gifts are all vanished 2,000 years ago? Very much valid today because his love, his grace has not ceased. It's still the same God, same love, same compassion, same power, and same mercy and grace. Let's pray. We close our eyes. For a couple of minutes, be silent and let this word sink into your hearts. And let remember, please remember these three gifts. Faith, discernment, and wisdom to bear all nine aspects of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithful, gentleness, self-control. But may it be quiet, let it sink into the heart, then I'll pray for all of you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for everyone the Zoom, Lord, whichever part of the world we are, Lord. Wherever we are, Lord, you are there with us, Lord. Your word is the same. Your power is the same. Pray for each one of us, Lord, in every one of our lives, Lord, 
you will bear the fruit, Lord. As we live by the Spirit, Lord, and, and desire these spiritual gifts, Lord, let the fruit be seen in our lives, Lord. You make us a display of your splendor, Lord, your workmanship, Lord, for the world to see that we are your children, Lord, and thereby let them call upon your name, Lord, and be saved, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of living for you, Lord, and being a blessing to people as you bless us. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. God bless you.